Hey friends, it's Lisa Mason Ziegler coming to you today here for the Gardener's Workshop Live and I have a great lineup of stuff for us to talk about and to look at too, right? So today I am going to be making three quarter inch soil blocks and putting them on the tray. We're going to talk about the moisture level of the mix, why I have a very specific way I put them on the tray, why you should have different size trays. Um, let's see what else we're going to talk about. Um, the blocking mix options and we're gonna do a lot of chatting along the way first off y'all you have to know that I absolutely adore making soy blocks so I don't get to do this very often anymore and I am then gonna plant the soil blocks with um, our our heirloom carnation mix shibata mix we're gonna be sowing those we're gonna be doing that and the whole way along we're gonna be talking about you know, some really great flower farming chit chat, y'all. And I'm also gonna tell you why I'm not doing sunflowers. I stopped last week. Well, this week is our last, the first week we haven't done them. And we're gonna talk about sunflowers. Um, so friends, I hope that you will um, like and share this broadcast. That really helps us so very, very much. Um, you know, you can, you're, if this is your first time here with us, um, let me just introduce myself. I'm Lisa Mason Ziegler, and I started out as an urban flower farmer about 24 years ago. I was barely a gardener, y'all. And I just read a book and just dove in head first, and it just hasn't stopped since then. Um, my business has grown in a lot of different ways, um, but the common denominator in everything I do is I love teaching people, and I love sharing what we do. And if one of the ways that we do that is our online courses, and if you are one of our students of any of our big old library of online courses, please comment and use the little sunflower emoji. That lets everybody know that you're, you know, maybe one of their classmates. And um, we love to know that our students are here and um, it's really a lot of fun. So let's talk about a couple things before I jump in and I'm gonna show you a tray of just sprouted seedlings that we started eight days ago on the 9th. I think today's the 17th, right? Um, so we're gonna take a look at those. But before we actually do that, I wanted to show you something that, you know, our team is just so blooming amazing, y'all. So they're always looking for helpful, innovative things to put in our order boxes for our online garden shop. And so Rhonda, who is our warehouse manager, along with Lane, who is our seed manager, and Lane has a real gift for just a lot of technology stuff and making things. So they now have these amazing flyers they are putting in to folks packages. This is Lisa's seven essential steps of soil blocking. And y'all, it takes you through the whole thing in one little, it's kind of on cardstock, you might say. Um, so that's one of them. And guess what else? Um, I have to share this because we do still have them, but I talked about these last week and it's just kind of crazy how they all just like fly out off the shelves. But you know, straw flowers has been one of the number one seeds that we've sold for a long time. Well, we've always sold the mix. If you don't know about straw flowers, if you're a flower farmer, holy cow, this is like the best and most beautiful bouquet mix, um, the bouquet filler there is. Yes, you can dry them, they dry true to color, but friends, we use them all up fresh. Um, there's never any opportunity to even dry them, but that is an option. But look, now we have the colors. You can buy the straight colors and you can find those over at thegardenersworkshop.com. And I just have to tell you, I'm kind of a little in love um, with the rose. Actually, y'all know how fickle I am. The lemon yellow, the rose, and the white. Um, I just always like bright, light colors, right? So you guys can, and this is another flyer. They're putting these in um, seed orders right now too. And, you know, we'd love to share those with you. All right, friends, so before we start making soil blocks, I wanna show you, um, I always start our Rebecca's, of course, we start talking about starting Cool Season Hardy Annuals, um, better known as Cool Flowers, which is the name of my book that came out in 2014, and friends, it is just really, I mean, 
it's, it's such a concept that is so different. Planting little baby plants um, right as we're going into winter is just doesn't seem right, right? And we totally get it. So cool flowers is a concept that y'all, I'd love to say I made this up, but I didn't. Our grandmas used to do this. And I've just rekindled that practice. And my book, Cool Flowers, tells you the basic concept of how to do everything. But here's the thing. I have made so many additional um, resources from webinars to planting guides, all free companions. And we have just made a new PDF that is, I'm calling it my All Things Cool Flowers Library, basically. So I put the link to request it on the head of this Facebook feed. If you just sign up, they will automatically send you the PDF. It has the videos, it has the book study, it has the um, podcast, the article I wrote for Slow Flowers, it's got everything, everything right there together. And the brand new webinar that I just did came out like two weeks ago, why I grow or why I don't grow these cool flowers anymore. And um, so it's all there. So I wanna tell you that you have to sign up to get it and that's gonna put you on my special personal list. And that means that when my course goes on sale October 1st, we're gonna send you some stuff. Um, because friend, we don't want anybody to miss it. It only opens once a year for five days. So you got to get the all things cool flowers. So let's take a look. I'm trying not to get things too dirty here, y'all. And I want to tell y'all this, go down a little rabbit hole before we even get started, right? Most people don't know that um, back in 2005, when I launched the product side of my business, selling the tools, seeds, and supplies that I use, um, when I launched that, it in fact was a direct sales company. Do y'all know what that is? That's like Pampered Chef, right? And I mean, we went all at it for about two years. Um, and we had sales reps, we called them garden stewards, you know, the people that would, you know, book a party or book a um, workshop basically, and come and demonstrate how to do stuff. And we had catalogs and they would sell our stuff. And then I got cancer. And that was a real wake-up call for me and that's not the rabbit hole I'm going down but we I made the decision during that time that I didn't want to be the owner of a big sales organization we wanted to do what I'm doing now and so I used to do what I'm getting ready to do for you guys making soul blocks in some of the best living rooms around on oriental rugs it is not a messy process when you have a specific ways to do it which is what I do some of the folks that have worked here over the years, I cannot believe what a mess they make doing this, and it doesn't have to be that way. So I'm really happy to show you today. So first, let's take a look. This is um, my tray of Rudbeckia. So the front half is the new, um, new for us on our store is the Rudbeckia Denver Double? Denver Daisy, sorry. The Denver Daisy, which you can see has really germinated well, and the back half of this tray is um, Rudbeckia Sahara. And it's a little slower, but it's also got um, a little darker stem, so there's a bunch that are really sprouting that you can't even really see yet. So these are eight days old. This is the, uh, um, the size tray. This is a cafeteria tray. You just buy them wherever you can find them. Um, and I you use the same ones for like 30 years, I'm on 22 on some of them that are in there. Um, and so this is for big growers. You would never wanna mix varieties on a tray. Um, so we use trays because for instance, when we were in high production, um, we would grow four trays of one variety, one color of a flower because we were planting 145, 120 foot beds, right? So one of the things that I wanted to talk about is I use different size trays to fit the need that I'm doing. Because here is the thing, y'all. Especially if you're like me and have limited light and heat mat space, you don't wanna have a bunch of leftover space. So we're, when I'm making the blocks, I'll talk to you about, this is my watering well. This is really important for me. Um, but I'm gonna show you that you wanna fill the tray up that you have. So I use several different size trays. 
We use the five by seven foam trays. We use the, I think they're five by 11 foam trays. The five by seven holds two clusters, 40 blocks. The other one holds three clusters, which is 60. Um, and then the one I'm gonna use today, and y'all are gonna die when you see this, people that know what it is, bingo. So first off, I wanna say to all of our friends out there that have been waiting for these, these come from England, and we are supposed to be getting them later this month. We haven't seen them yet, but if you want them, if you go to the store, thegardenersworkshop.com, go to the seed starting supplies, there's a sign up. And those are people that are in line to buy these trays when they come in. And I will tell you guys, I have, I have bought a boatload, but they're still not gonna last very long. These are that hard, rigid plastic. And this holds, if I'm not mistaken, five or six clusters of um, 20 blocks. So it's like a nice, perfect half size to that big tray. They're really, really nice. Um, so this is what we're gonna use today. And I always get the question of, um, why do we use foam trays? Well, first off, they are not disposable trays, y'all. We use them for years and years and years. There just literally is not something like this. First off, these are much more expensive. Um, but there's not trays that we have found and we are constantly surfing restaurants all that good stuff, restaurant suppliers and just everywhere. Um, so the foam trays, because um, people throw rocks at me about using foam trays, but y'all, they are permanent fixtures. You are not throwing them away and they last forever. Um, and so they're a really renewable, reusable source. And we use them because like when I'm starting tomatoes, I need a small tray. Um, all right, so should we make blocks? Let me um, rearrange my stuff here, and I'm gonna move my camera so that y'all can see so much better. Let me just, y'all, I had a long day at the office today. It was so very productive, but I haven't been here all day. I'm gonna turn my camera so y'all can see in. All right, so I'm gonna talk for just a second. One of the things I wanted to talk about is can you, you can see how wet this blocking mix is. So this is the ready-made blocking mix that we sell on our website. We also always have the recipe there. You do not have to buy the ready-made, you can make it at home. Why is it so essential to use what we call blocking mix? Because friends, these blocks, let me see if I can, I just wore, these are still damp. I can't pick one up. Well, maybe I can. So these blocks never ever go in a container. And that means, I'm just gonna, look at that. See that little thing? So that little block of soil is nothing but compost, peat moss, and some nu um, nutrients. There's no perlite and no vermiculite. vermiculite. There, it is very dense and that makes it hold together. And it's pretty vulnerable at this point at the growth because there's hardly any roots in there. But once the roots grow up, then, I mean, you just can't believe how sturdy these little blocks are. And that's all based on the blocking mix that we use. Now, this is double sifted, but friends, you're still gonna find the occasional stick in here. I mean, it just can't get any better than this. You won't believe after you, if you make yours at home, like you find these kinds of little sticks. Um, if you sift peat moss or cocoa fiber at home to, do, to make it at home, you won't believe how many chunks of stuff are in there. So this is leagues above that, but there are still chunks. So the basic, recipe you can find on our website or you can find the ready-made mix. Do you see how moist this is? It is basically three parts of the soil, the blocking mix, to one part water. So that means if you use a container like this, that you would put three scoops of this and one scoop of water. You may have to add a little bit more water and you can see mine's a little bit wetter than I'd like for it to be, but here's the tip. 
It is far easier to make blocks with too wet of soil than it is with too dry. So the moisture is key to make it so you can get the blocking mix, get the blocks out of the blocker. And so literally Bobo has been using this all day to make blocks. Um, you can find the blocker. We import these from England where they're still made by um, the sisters, we call them. The sisters bought this business from Mr. Ladbrook. He's the one that engineered this, I don't know how many decades ago. Um, and we import them from England. So there's all kinds of stuff on top of this. It looks like a little bird's been visiting this. All right, so what I want to point out is that First off, your hands, my hands are dirty, not from making blocks, but from messing with soil. Um, I typically like to make a nice little pile of soil. This is a potato masher for anyone that doesn't know that, right? This is the best mixing tool to incorporate the water into the blocking mix. I have tried every gardening tool, but this undoubtedly is the best tool. So I mix my soil. There is definitely a benefit to do it the night before. Many of us never think that far ahead. It just, the soil is a little bit wetter in a little different way, um, but it's definitely doable. So I tend to make a little pile like you see here so you have something to drive the blocker down into. Two hands, you hold on to the stationary bar and you push it down in the soil. I'm jiggling it back and forth just to make sure it's getting into the chambers. And here's the thing, because there's moisture involved, a lot of times this can get suctioned onto the bottom of the tray. And so I just pull it to the side. I always push down twice. And that's a little too much soil there, y'all, actually. Um, and so then I just use my potato masher to just kind of scrape the excess off the bottom so it's nice and flat. And then I'm gonna show you, here is our tray. And so when I place blocks on the tray, you can see that if I put the blocker up against this side of the tray, that leaves a little room over here. And that's exactly what I want to do. I want to leave a space where I can use my watering can every morning to pour the water in. And I like to go as fast as I can, y'all, because I have a lot to do and a lot of places to go, just like most of you. So having a nice well to pour your water into makes you be a faster water. And then you literally just give it a squeeze and a push and a pull, and there you go, guys. So I just need to finish making these. And, you know, people have asked me, and somebody actually the other day said to me, oh my gosh, it is so time consuming. Not really, y'all. When you consider that my friends that grow in trays sow the seeds, into these trays and then they pull the seedlings apart after they've germinated to then plant those seedlings into individual cell blocks. I mean, let's talk about how much time that is because you know what's gonna happen? Now notice I'm gonna leave just a little bit of space between the clusters. That allows water to flow freely when I'm, water when I'm um, watering in the morning. Um, so they sow the seeds then they have to, I think they call it pricking them. They prick them apart and then they plant them into trays. Let me just tell you how time consuming that is. Then you add on top of that how many of them actually probably croak during that process. Um, and friends, we're gonna sow seeds in these blocks and this is where they grow and this is where they stay until they go to the garden. Literally, you're just watering. I'm really kind of, I can't remember how many sets of blocks fit on this tray. I think it's six. And you don't have to be crazy about cleaning it, but you don't want to drop a bunch of soil droplets onto your tray because you have to remember that, I wanna push these over a little bit. I'm wondering if six isn't gonna fit on here. Um, you know, if you get droplets of soil in there, it just, you have to take care of this. Plants have to grow in this tray for, you know, four weeks or whatever it is you're gonna, you're starting. And if y'all notice, now that my pile's not so deep, I'm actually pushing down three times. You don't wanna pack the chambers, 
but you want a nice, solid, firm, little soil block. I'm thinking I've, I, I may have left too much space up here. I don't think we're gonna get a six one in there. We're not. So friends, that's not the most lined up ones that I've ever done, but there you have it. And if you experience the edges of your blocks really pulling up when you're getting them out of the blocker with pushing the plunger, that's because the soil's too dry. Um, so when we were in full production and when Kelly, who is now, you know, our, she is the manager of our online courses and our IT person, um, she started here as a mom that wanted to stay home with her kids as our seed starter. She really knew nothing about, all right, y'all, while I'm talking, I'm just gonna fix the camera so you guys can see exactly what I'm doing, maybe a little closer. What do you think? Is that better? Um, so Kelly started working here like over 10 years ago as just our seed starter. Um, you know, because as a flower farmer, I mean, it's like you have the best intentions of starting seeds as you're supposed to for succession planting, which is the way to build your bottom line, y'all. You have got to get your succession planting down. And we would say, okay, we'll cut flowers this morning and we'll start seeds this afternoon. Well, we never would get to it. And so then Kelly asked about, you know, was there something she could do? And I said, yes. I taught her how to be a seed starter. And so she did nothing but start our seeds. Without her, we'd have never been able to go into what we called that high production years when we were producing 10 to 15,000 stems of flowers a week, y'all, off of my little less than three acre total property, um, less than half of that in full production. Um, anyway, the secret to all of that is succession planting. So let's talk about seed sowing. I don't know if y'all know about this. This is the little aluminum seed pan. You'll find that on our website too. And it comes in our soil blocking kits. Um, the thing is that if you've been using a little plastic cup, like I was, I was using a little soft butter, you know, a little short tub um, to pour my seeds into and then sowing them. You just can't imagine how much, um, Static electricity is in that pla that plastic. So um, these are, I told you this already, didn't I? This is the Carnation Shibata mix. And um, I haven't grown these for many years. We we're selling the seed again. We need a really round flower in spring. So we're going back to this. Um, so I was actually um, a, a science guy, was taking one of my, programs years ago and pulled me aside afterwards and said, you need lab pans. And that's exactly what this is, y'all. This is what they use in labs to measure stuff. Um, and so we use it as our seed tray. So I'm going to pour these seeds. These are not the smallest seeds. Huh. So the best way that we have found to sow seeds is um, a toothpick, high tech y'all, aluminum seed pan, and a little saliva on the toothpick. And so um, I wanted to tell you before I forget, oh, we gotta name the tray first y'all, we, we gotta tag this. So we use painter's tape, used to use masking tape till one of my wonderful followers, well actually more than one, shared that with me. And um, so the painter's tape just really lasts and stays stuck to the tray. We use this on plug trays and these trays. We use our garden marker, which does not fade with moisture and UV rays, so it really holds up outside. So let's write what this is. You know, especially when you start getting employees, you really have to have clear labeling of your um, trays because they don't know. You know what I mean? It's like you can't get upset for them for planting, mixing up plantings or whatever because they weren't properly tagged. And so we're gonna put this right down here. You can see where previous tape has been. 
and the joy is always trying to figure out how to put it so people can read it, which that people would mostly be me. So I'm just gonna stick that on there. All right, so that's what we use. Tape and the garden marker. The garden marker is the bomb, y'all. Um, all right, so I am gonna moist, I'm not spitting on you Facebook, y'all. Um, so when we're sowing a ton of seeds, we spit right here in the tray. Not gonna happen, y'all. So, I literally just, when I touch, do you see that? Can y'all see that? I just touch the toothpick to that seed, and I don't care how tiny they are. If you've got dust for seeds, with no static electricity, a little sticky saliva, and a toothpick, you're on it. All right, y'all, I gotta make a little, can y'all see? So, Dianthus does not get covered. And here's something, here's a good lesson to learn. It's best to not have so many seeds that they're all clustered up because they stick to, you'll pick up more than one at a time. And this goes really, really quickly. So what I'm doing is just touching my moistened toothpick to the seed because Dianthus needs light to germinate. I am just firmly seeding the seed on the surface of each block and it goes really fast when you're not talking to people while you do it so when Kelly was our seed starter um, she got up to doing so she would come to work when everybody came to work but she stayed inside and and made trays of soil blocks and sewed them she would do um, I think her number was 12 of these trays, the big trays that have 240 on each one, she could make the blocks and sow the seeds of 12 trays before lunch. That is a pretty significant number, gang. So I am just gonna continue on doing these. So, um, you know, you do for soil blocks just like you do for any seed you're starting. These will go into on top of a seedling heat mat. They are cool flowers or cool season hardy annuals, but they still need warmth to germinate. And what we do to really make them happy is we actually put cookie cooling racks on our seedling heat mats, which are about a half inch tall, right? I mean, I'm talking about those little racks that you use when you take cookies out of the oven, y'all. And that creates a space between the heat mat and the bottom of the trays. And that cools the heat mat down just a smidgen, but yet it still produces heat 24 seven. Hope I don't lose count what I'm doing here for talking to y'all. That's one of the really important steps for me. When I'm soil blocking, I don't listen to music. I don't talk to people, except of course y'all, because it is so easy to lose your place. I mean, if you're sowing snapdragons, um, those tiny seeded things, you'd never be able to tell which ones you're in or not. So I have a system. I go the same, you know, I go back and forth, and if I stop talking, I typically will leave my toothpick in the last one that I did. This is perhaps, if you're a person that likes to knit, likes to cross stitch, likes to weed, this is like the most satisfying thing on the planet to do. And then when they sprout into little baby plants, you just won't believe it. It just, this is why I became a flower farmer, y'all. I was like a crazy seed starter gone wild and had to do something with all that stuff, right? So I'm firmly seeding this on the surface, you gotta be sure it's got contact with the soil. And I'm just happy to say that there was, oh, that one didn't stay, which one was it? I think that might have two. Um, this was supposed to be 50 seeds and it actually seems like it's 60 seeds. We always try to put a pinch more than we're, y'all imagine that there's a golden retriever hair. All right, so that's where I'm stopped. And now we have to open another pack. Um, so this Shibata, 
I think that's how you say it, um, is a mix. And the reason we brought it back into growing it and selling the seed is because we really need those round flowers in the spring. You know, that's one of the things that, um, yes, y'all, I just stuck a dirty toothpick in my mouth to re-moisten it. It's really pretty fascinating how much better seeds stick to the toothpick with saliva, by the way. And you know, if you need more guidance on seed starting, um, I have a, an online course, it's like 20 bucks, y'all. But if you buy a soul blocking kit, then it comes in that. It's a little bit of a discount. Um, that takes you through the whole step from doing this right through to taking them out and putting them in the garden and even direct seeding in the garden, right? Which is a whole nother story. So I had all these things I was gonna to talk to you about, which I will talk to you, but I can't do it while I'm sowing these seeds because I will surely lose my place. So these will go onto the seedling heat mat with cookie cooling racks under it. They get watered once a day, every morning, thoroughly. If you go to my website, thegardenersworkshop.com and go to the Learning Center, where all of our resources are, go to the video guide and go to the soil blocking there. Um, there's videos showing you how to water, because that's the number one call we get, or email, or question, that people say they dry out before the next day. Well, that means they're not being watered thoroughly, because friends, my room, my grow room is south, facing, southeast facing, and gets hot as a greenhouse in there. I mean, it gets up to almost 100 degrees during the day when it's sunny. And I only have to water once a day. You want your seed, your blocks, to dry out overnight. You want them to go through that wet, dry cycle. The next morning, your blocks, see I lost my place, y'all. I'm putting two in there just in case. Um, the next morning, when you come to water them, if they're still wet, then the room is, the conditions are not conducive to healthy growing for seedlings. You want an air temperature that lets the soil blocks dry out. And being under grow lights, depending on what kind of grow light you have, unfortunately, LEDs, um, this is why they're not my favorite, um, don't give off any warmth. So you don't get any assistance from the light um, to heat up anything. At the other end of the spectrum, you don't want T5s because they get so hot, they'll cook your stuff. Um, so you have to really keep them really far away. We like T8s or T12s. The ones that we sell are T12s. Um, and they give off just enough warmth that when you have the air temperature, for cool season hardy annuals, we like an air temperature of 65 to 70 degrees. And then that little bit added um, bump from the, the grow lights really, really help. And um, so I'm gonna bring y'all up. I, I don't like talking to the side of my phone, y'all. Do all this without cutting you off is pretty miraculous, <laughs> if I don't say so myself. Um, so we will take them in. I'll put them on the um, seedling heat mat cookie cooling rack. I'm going to then lay the wide weave burlap. Wide weave burlap, I have learned, um, and I actually learned this from somebody that actually did it outside and direct seeded carrots. Um, you know how carrots are a pain to germinate. Well, they had great results, and we just adapted it to, to soil blocking a couple of years ago, and it works beautifully. So, so many of the flower seeds that we grow are sown on the surface, which means they'll dry out really, really quickly, and so we have never been dome users because that just really is a perfect environment for disease like dampening off to develop. Um, and the person I learned from, Elliot Coleman, just really was not a believer of domes. Um, so, and domes I know work for some people, but you really have to monitor them really closely. And frankly, y'all, I don't do that. I'm just not that able to be able um, 
to kind of pay that much close attention throughout the day to that. So we have found that the burlap is the happy medium. It's wide weave. You can find it on our website. It actually comes in the kits, um, the complete seed starting kit, free. Um, it's wide weave, so air and oxygen can still really get to the, your blocks or to the su surface of your soil, um, but yet it retains moisture. It does trap some. And we have excellent germination with that. So we'll put them on the seedling heat mat on a cookie rack because of being cool flowers. Um, lay the burlap on it. Don't do anything else. You don't wait it. You don't water through it. You just lay it on top. That just helps to retain it. Tomorrow morning when I come out, I pull it back, I water and tin, and then just lay it back down. That's as easy as it can be, right? Then once 50% or more of these blocks show signs of light and cracking, we move them over to the grow lights, y'all. And it depends on which grow lights you have as to how far apart. For T8s and T12s, they're right on top. T5s, you gotta give about 20 inches, um, which is just not a very good use of space. So friends, kind of exciting in it. I mean, I just love this time of year. I love this. I love trays of baby plants. Um, and I am so totally stoked. Do y'all know what these are? These are plant markers for the garden. And we have never had these at the beginning of a season. And because we're direct seeding so many different things this year, I pulled them out um, because it's really neat, especially if you know somebody has really pretty handwriting, which Christine does that works with us, um, to have them write the name of the flower that's glowing. Because let me just tell y'all something. Nobody remembers. Don't think you're going to remember. Um, but anyway, you'll find these on our website. We have several different sizes, but this is the biggest. I think it's 18 inches. This means that once the seed, you know, you'll push it in the ground this much, right? So it'll be like this. You'll have all this. You can write on it. Um, but you'll be able to see the stake after the plants start growing. Because for us, for imagery, for so the um, store, we need a definitive, um, not diagnosis, identification, right? Um, so I'm really excited about that. And I'll tell you a really great tip that we did years ago um, that we really, really love. And I still have the rocks out in my garden. We use puffy paint. You get that at a craft store. People used to paint on, remember when sweatshirts were in with all that lumpy design stuff on it? Well, that's what it was. Holds forever. You could do that. If you weren't gonna write, the, like you could put larkspur or poppies. And um, I don't know that I'd be so specific. Cause, and then if you do get specific and the next year you're not growing that, you know what you can do? You can dip this whole stick into paint and let it all be like white, and then you can do it all over again. Y'all, it is just so very, very fun. And these are things that I'm getting to do now that we are just, this is our farewell season of selling. Not growing flowers, y'all, just selling flowers. And um, I'm getting to do, I'm getting to do what people think I get to do all the time. Um, I'm, I, this is one of the exciting things that I wanted to tell y'all, and we really haven't talked about this very much, about what am I doing here next year, right? Well, of course, I'm working on new courses, but um, my garden, we are squeezing it down to an eighth of an acre. I think that's right. 50 by 100. That's 5,000 square feet. That's an eighth. A, a, an acre is 40,000 square feet. An eighth of an acre is 5,000 square feet. So that will be 50 foot deep and 100 foot long garden. That is still huge. I couldn't believe that was only an eighth of an acre. People are nuts that say, oh, I'm just starting and I'm gonna do an acre. It's like, oh my gosh, who could not be overwhelmed by that, right? So we are growing a garden here next year um, that is just, it's gonna be so thrilling to not have the pressure to grow certain things so we have enough for bouquet mixtures and recipes and to see how much we can produce out of that space. and. Um, it's just really um, going to be a lot of fun, and I'm glad y'all are going to come along for it. Um, it's really going to be fun. My students, one of the things that I do now in my flower farming school is that I we have closed Facebook groups. Um, one of them's my alumni group, and I now jump on there and do these impromptu live videos um, from the garden and from here on the farm showing them stuff. I mean, like day before yesterday, oh my gosh, I was a hot, sweaty mess, y'all. 
but I came across the most amazing beneficial insect um, that people don't get to see very often. And so I pulled my gloves off and tried to fix my hair and we went live right there in the garden for my students to, to see what this guy looked like, how they can identify him better, how you steer clear of them because they're just like bees, y'all. They'll bite you, but they're good guys. And, um, you know, the thoughts of how I'm going to be able to do so much more of that kind of stuff is um, just really more that than I can really think about because here's what I really wanted to talk to you guys about. Um, I am sure not everybody, um, so many of us are so burnt out and fried and exhausted and overwhelmed, should I go on right now, that um, you know you, you haven't even really realized this. But all around us folks, if you're a flower farmer, all around us, um, if you spend any time on social media and follow some of the bigger growers or some of the more um, social media focused farmer florist or florist, um, the, the shortage problem that we've been talking about now for over a year of flowers, it's been longer than a year. It's longer than a year. I don't even know how long it is anymore, right? Um, people, the floral industry is really, really suffering, and I'm not going to talk about that. What I want to talk about is that I have flower farming friends that are killing themselves trying to grow enough flowers to even remotely meet the demand. I'm not kidding you. So who can you, I tell you some people that you need to follow. You need to follow Sunny Meadows Flower Farm. Um, she is, um, Steve and Gretel have a big farm in Columbus, Ohio. They've been working their butts off for years. They have, I mean, she just posted the other day and I reposted it that if you need me, we'll be in the dahlia patch till frost. They just cannot keep up with the demand. And what I wanna say to you is there is plenty of room in the cut flower growing industry for new and for seasoned growers to expand. Um, Y'all, this is a time in history like never before. This window of opportunity for local growers to kind of like, you know, ring the back doorbell of those poor flower shop people that are pulling their house hair out because they can't get what they ordered. And they open their door and there is a van full of beautiful local grown flowers. I have just such this cartoon in my mind. Um, but this is a time in our history of our industry that we as growers, domestic growers, to grow local, doesn't matter where in the world you are, you wanna sell local. You wanna avoid the 3,000 mile trek that these flowers currently make from California to wherever or South America to Miami. Um, Y'all, that's where most of our flowers come from, our Ecuador and Colombia. It's not nearly as dreamy as people wanna think about like Holland. Um, those are the very high-end flowers and we don't really see those here. Um, and this is just a time like any other time. And I'll tell you, um, I, I highly you go and check out the video on this page that I'm going to tell you. Go to our website, thegardenersworkshop.com, and go to our online courses, and go to Jenny Love's online course. Whether you're interested in her topic or not, you have to listen to her little intro video. It's about a minute and a half long. And she tells it like it is, that there's no better time in our history um, for people to enter into what we call her area, which is people that are doing events with the flowers they've grown, um, as well as people using outside flowers as well, that the industry has beat up the current florist. They're exhausted. They're not hitting the pavement to get the jobs. There are people that have been waiting to get married for a, over a year now. Um, you have to go listen to her. I mean, after I listened to Jenny's video, after they sent me the audio of that before they put it to the beautiful imagery that's there, I just thought that's it in a nutshell. Um, and I will tell you that, y'all gonna stop talking about that. There's just been no time like now. Um, for our industry, and it's hard work, do not get me wrong. You know, there is a thorny patch to every great um, best spot, and everybody can have their peace, and, but you have to work for it. Um, 
to, I'm just really thinking about what else I want to say. We all, we just have to kind of kick back and look at this with new eyes. We have so many people in this industry that call themselves flower farmers and they're trying and working really hard, but they are what I call, and I don't mean this in any bad way, dabblers. They just really are afraid to take the plunge. They haven't set their business up. They haven't gone at it full speed as a professional, which is where you really, um, really um, makes the difference. That's what sets you apart. Um, and y'all, we have success story after success story after success story of growers. I mean, you can listen to Dave Dowling talk. Everybody that's in this industry and has been in it for a while can share with you. There is not too many domestic growers. Yeah, if there's 20 growers in your area, you can't all grow at the, and sell at the farmer's market. That's, we hear all kinds of crazy stories. People just trying to really take the high road. It's not the high road, gang. Um, so I am going to look at your questions and do some answering here. Um, in just a minute. So I wanted to say why we've stopped growing suns or planting them, and I'm gonna give you the tip about light in your sunflowers that Dave Dowling gave to me again. He gives it to me all the time and I've just never done it. Um, if you want your sunflowers, I'm gonna be posting a picture um, of the sunflowers we cut this week. They're those perfect small medallion size sunflowers and I love them that way but we'd love to have them just a little bit bigger the reason they're getting smaller and smaller as the day length gets shorter is because of daylight and Dave's recommendation was is that when we plant them outside into the garden to string a light that has a hundred watt bulb every 15 feet or the equivalent stretched out and you turn them on for one hour at night it's called interruption lighting and that makes them grow taller and get bigger. And I will be honest, I told Dave I was gonna do it, but y'all, it's just so exhausting here. I mean, I have more, I just can't do it. So because I haven't done it, that's why we stopped growing sunflowers. I know that we have the heat to grow longer. So our last planting um, went in yesterday and we're gonna keep up with how that all goes. Um, and friends, I just wanna encourage everybody, it is time that if you really wanna be a flower grower, you've got to get down to serious business, get to become a professional, do it right, and get your customers, and get busy doing it. Um, I think you would be very surprised in our um, closed groups, people talking about just how their businesses are going and what they did, and some of them, it took them a little bit longer, and how wonderful it is to go to florist and have them buy everything, it's like, it restores your soul. Um, so friends, let me bring you around here. Um, and did I show you? So we keep our toothpicks handy. We keep all of this stuff together. It's our seed starting kit that we keep here on the farm. And I wanted to say that I saw our friend Marie on here. Marie is one of my flower customers, y'all. And she brings us the most precious and sweetest gifts. And she left gifts here today, which I have not opened. Um, there's one for Penny and Tucker. Penny is Suzanne's golden, who's just a baby, and Tucker is mine. And then she brought a gift for Suzanne and I, one for each. And I can't wait to open them. All right, friends, let's, let me bring you over here. Let me see what your questions are. Oh, she wants me to open it. All right. For you, Marie, I wouldn't do this for anybody else. So, y'all, she brings the most beautiful wrapping. And I've already read the card. Oh, and these are my favorites. A pillow. What could be on here? It's got to have flowers on it. I can almost promise you that. Oh, look, y'all. It's a golden with a flower crown on. Oh, oh, thank you, Marie. We're going to miss you, too. And she makes homemade cookies for my dog, y'all. 
Holy cow. Thank you so much. All right, y'all, I'm going back to the top and I'll scroll through here and see if y'all have any questions for me. And I can hardly believe it. Hello, all my students. Rhonda, someone asked why styrofoam trays and do they insulate the blocks from heat? Inquiring minds. So Rhonda is our warehouse manager, y'all. And so she's the one that gets all of the questions that get sent in um, via email. If they get past Anne, Anne is our um, communication person. And if she can't answer it, and she's a flower farmer, gardener, um, soul blocking person. If she can't answer it, then she passes it to Rhonda. And then Rhonda taps me um, because we're all soil blockers. Um, anyway, the styrofoam trays, I chose styrofoam all those years ago just because they were inexpensive and accessible in the sizes that we want. Um, so it wasn't about the insulation, although that's probably a good point. Hello, all you students. Paula, when I share it, it shares with Messenger, not on our Facebook page. Huh, that's weird. So yeah, if you all would like and share this, that makes face Facebook happy with me and that means they show my page to more people um, and that really makes us happy. Hello, Louisiana. Hello, everybody. I see lots of students on here. Just ordered my straw flowers last night. Y'all, straw flowers are amazing. So they are a cool flower. However, they aren't winter hardy for us here through winter. So we start them in very early spring, which for us, um, is like mid-February is when we plant the transplant, so we start them in January. We succession plant them now, like every six weeks, six to eight weeks from that point on, and they do beautifully. They are amazing. I mean, Suzanne and Bobo, the bouquet makers, loved them. I mean, they just loved having them to add to their bouquets. Janet, forgive my many repeat questions. It is quite all right. Are there any seeds I can start this late? Well, Janet, oh, you're in zone 5B6A. First off, it really depends on your frost date. And this is what I tell people. If you have your beds prepared and ready, because what happens as we start moving into winter is the soil gets wet and cold and you can't work it. So if you have your beds prepared and ready, you have more wiggle room with transplants than you do with direct seeding. And I have been known to do this on more than one occasion, especially if I lived in a cold zone, this is what I would do. Get your beds ready immediately, like tomorrow and Saturday. Um, I would hoop and cover them, even though nothing is in there. That'll help the soil stay a smidgen warmer. And then when it starts your seed, start your seed, excuse me, and, um, as soon as they're ready to go out there, you'll plant them into that amazing little mecca. And as long as your ground isn't frozen yet, um, which I imagine where you are, it does get frozen, um, you can get them in the ground. Oh, Nicole, so if you ordered the book last night, there is a ton of companion resources. And the link that I put at the head of this Facebook um, is all things cool flowers y'all it's got w the webinar two webinars at least all the podcasts some videos the book study articles I've written blog posts it's got everything Tara I just love that you recognize and appreciate the strengths and gifts of your employees you know Tara thank you for thinking I'm so sweet but that's just good business um, I had a business coach for many years who I still talk to from time to time, and one of the things that I learned from her was for happy, happy employees are more productive employees, and more productive employees are more productive because they do something they really enjoy and get satisfaction from. There you go. Um, Bobo, who worked with me here on the farm, she'll tell you, she would no more work in our warehouse. She'll help us during the winter when we're in a pinch but she wants to be outside. I mean, that is her, she plants, and I have to make her come in during heat warnings, you know, that the heat level is so high. So getting people into their job makes them happy, hi, Tina. Um, and it just really, really is good business, right? And we have an awesome team, and um, anyway, Helena. I cannot grow Rudbeckia for anything. I have tried for two years, multiple times per season, 
and made sure I bought fresh sheets, I give up. I did buy a 12 pack from the local hard store, net hardware store. Now I have to hope they will make it through the winter. Well, first off, Rebecca's um, are winter hardy like zone five. I don't know where you are, but they're pretty winter hardy. Some Rebecca's are much more difficult than others. That's why I specifically recommend specific varieties. I will tell you um, that Denver Daisy that I just started is the fastest we've ever started. Indian Summer, Prairie Sun, Goldilocks, Sahara is not bad, um, but Triloba is tough. Anything that takes a long time is tough because there's a lot of ways to kill it during that long time. So don't give up. Get some of this Denver Daisy seed. It really germinates quick. Janet, hi from Mississippi. Started my seeds Wednesday. Can't wait to, for the seeds to come up. Oh, thank you. Um, so, I understand about the craziness of me having so many resources and they're all not in one place, but here's the reality that most people don't understand. When you're on the backside of all this, we can't just put everything in one place because there's people called scrapers they're people that steal stuff off of your website. <laughs> and so you can't make it but so easy for people to get stuff. Um, so, but the way that we're offering this, we'll see how it goes. Y'all, there's a whole dark world in the internet as everybody I think imagines, but um, it's different when you're in business. It's just kind of crazy actually. The levels of security that we have to have are very expensive and costly equipment, but you just have to do it. Janet, what is that tray called? Um, it's, well, it's a tray um, and it's on our website. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they call it, but there's not very much of, if you go to the seed starting supplies on our website, you'll find it. Yep, you can use, I mean, these are meat, the foam trays that we have are meat trays. I mean, that's what their intention is for. Um, we totally only sell them for convenience um, because A, we take care of a lot of people that don't eat meat. Um, and secondly, it's just convenient. And it's also convenient to have them all the same size. And we we get the size that is conducive to fit the blockers just a little bit bigger so that it doesn't take up too much space under the grow lights um, or um, on the heat mat. Does it need to be food grade plastic? No, not at all. Not at all. Question, what buckets do you use to harvest the taller flowers so the stems stay straight? Um, so just like how I have a bunch of different size trays to fit my need, I have a lot of different buckets. I have a ton of different kinds of buckets here. There's some that have, that are tall and skinny that only have a hole this big, some that have bigger holes, some that are shorter and wider. We have five gallon buckets. There are different heights of five gallon buckets. Then I used to use um, kitchen trash cans. When I grew lilies and tons of big coxcomb, um, so I use them all. And then you have what you need for the size and length of stem um, that um, you're cutting. Jim Ellis, what use instead of peat moss, something sustainable? Excellent point, Jim, because you won't believe a conversation I had today. Um, you can use cocoa fiber, which we sell the, um, the grower size cocoa bricks. I mean, the grower size, I mean, makes a huge amount of gallons of peat moss like and then we sell the bricks, which make two and a half gallons. I'm thinking that a big brick makes 12 or 15 gallons of stuff. Um, but we are pursuing um, having something more sustainable. Um, but the recipe, you can use cocoa or peat moss. I love your mix, it's great. Thank you, Janet. What do you use to sift the compost and peat? We actually have a sifter on our website. Y'all, we only sell what I use. It's like, I sell all the pieces for the way that I do things. And I will definitely tell you, if you don't have a person that is handy to kind of like make you a homemade sifter, which is totally possible. And we have a lot of people that don't have that. So we offer, it's another one. It comes from the same place that these trays do from England. So a lot of times we go out of stock on them during the year and we can't get them because of, they have worse shipping problems over there these days because of COVID. 
So Cocoa Core is what we use. When I made my blocks, I failed to add enough water. I'm loving the review. You're so, you know what? I can remember, and we have to get off here, y'all. Um, I remember like 40 years ago, I'm 60, not 40, probably 35 years ago, long before I was a gardener. PBS, you know, that was like one of four stations you got on TV, right? I remember seeing Elliot Coleman making soil blocks on PBS, and all I really remembered, I wasn't even a gardener, I was nothing else to watch on TV. I can remember him saying, if you have trouble getting the blocks to come out of the blocker, be sure your blocker's clean and nothing is jammed in there. Secondly, make sure the mix is wet enough. That's the most common reason. And I found that that is the best advice um, that I've remembered. Soul blocking is the best. Thank you, Lisa. I've been doing this for almost four, year na four years now. You can get so many more plants this way. You know, it just really does um, grow a superior seedling. People, and I have a lot of really professional friends, and it's like they kind of nod and smile at me like, okay, you poor little thing. You just don't realize how much more work you're doing. And in fact, it's completely the opposite. I mean, when we were in high production, we did 100,000 seedlings a year through all the seasons. And we used that hand blocker, made them like nobody's tomorrow, and grew them without greenhouse. I have no greenhouse, y'all. We grew them all in that grow room and a carport. And it is so doable, and it is so low labor, and it is such a great little seedling, but you have to figure the system out. That's what the difference is. And so I appreciate it. So on that green tray that we have, it's not available on the website, but you can get in line to get on um, our wait list. Peg, when I ordered the soil blocking kit, the foam tray in the kit was cut in half. Not nice. Well, that probably happened during shipping, and I hope you reached out to us because we would surely replace that for you. Yeah, we got a lot of soil blocking, folks. Going to try this for the first time this next season. Marianne, highly recommend it. Go over to our website and look at all the resources. Lots and lots of videos. Janet says, I love your seeds because you tell us if they need light or not. And I'll tell you another little rabbit hole, and then i got to get off here, y'all. Um, when I launched the Gardener's Workshop, that direct sales company back in 2005, um, when I went to look for seeds to sell, packaged seeds, you know, like to buy a line of seeds to sell. I couldn't find any wholesale seed source pack of packaged seeds that said on there whether you cover them with soil or not. It was like, that was a major step to me. I mean, I learned that from Elliot Coleman. And it's like, how can we sell seeds that don't tell people whether or not you should, they need light or not to germinate or darkness? And that's what led us to package seeds. We don't save seeds. We do save the seeds of the poppies here, the big giant poppy pods. Um, everything else we buy from seed houses and hybridizers, just like all the other seed people in the world do that package. Very few grow people grow. Um, there are a couple, but not many, because it is a very it's a whole cup of tea in itself. Um, but that's why we started, so we can give really complete instructions. Um, Carnations are dianthus, Helena. Um, I do not grow dahlias anymore, not because dahlias aren't beautiful, and they are very sellable, and they are a high-dollar crop, but in our high pest pressure, long, hot season, they were more labor-intensive than I was willing to give them. Um, so we stopped growing dahlias a couple years ago. I did grow them when we were in high production because right now we would be I mean, we'd be pulling our hair out, selling them as fast as we could get them cut and out of here. Um, but they are needy. And it's because of the pests. I can grow them great, but we also grow great insects here. And we don't use chemicals and bagging them like I see so many people do it. I just can't even imagine in a high volume commercial world. What is the trick? I have trouble getting the seed to come off the toothpick. I have your kit and so just like you show us. So the soil needs to be moist and when you touch it to the soil, you just kind of scrape it just a little bit um, so that it comes right off. 
All right, y'all, that's it. I just got a message that my husband is on the way home and he has food. <laughs> Paige, she loves to knit. Anybody that likes to do that kind of repetitive motion, um, you really, really love soil blocking and sowing seeds. So friends, remember to sign up to receive that um, All Things Cool Flowers PDF. Would love for you to have that. Um, and we're just working on so much great stuff for you guys and resources. And I'm really, really excited where we're going and um, some really cool stuff coming down the pike. And don't forget, so Flower Farming School, my October 1st, through the 5th. It's only open for five days, friends. And if you're one of my students, please give a shout out to everybody to say you took the course and that people can ask you questions. I think that's the best medicine that people can hear. Um, I can talk to the cows, come home and tell them how great it is, but for people to share their experience, I would really, that helps me more than anything else. So for folks to start talking about that, we really, really would appreciate that. And um, friends, and Marie, thank you so much for these beautiful, the pillow. I might have to steal my sister's present. Not, not really. And I'm sure Tucker's going to love his cookies. But I'm pretty sure that's what is in there. We'll see. So, friends, until we meet again, I will see you next week on Wednesday, 1130 on Instagram for Ask a Flower Farmer, 1 o'clock for Clubhouse, the Flower Farmer Show, where I love to answer even more of your questions. Till we meet again, friends. Ciao.